um, a series is called Museums of the Mind, and the idea is to talk about different art forms, as well as disciplines that aren't regarded as art, or perhaps aren't regarded as art yet, and about how putting them in museum settings can change what we think about them. Um, we also want to think about this the other way around and talk about how some of these art forms can influence how we see museums. But today we're going to start with photography in the museum. It's a vast subject, so it's a very, it's a very useful thing that our three panellists are coming at it from very different angles. And I hope there'll be some intriguing overlaps. Um, first of all, I'm delighted to introduce Bill Sherman, who's the director of the Warburg Institute. Um, it's also likely to be relevant that he was previously the director of research and collections at the VNA when its new photography galleries were being planned and when the collection of the Royal Photographic Society moved from what was then called the National Media Museum. Um, Matt Collishaw is a conceptual artist who's worked in more mediums than I can list here, but two of the preoccupations that run through his art are both the history of art and technology which means that he's worked with photography in interesting ways. If you're in Ghent at the moment, or likely to be there before the end of 2021, he has an installation that reinterprets the Ghent altarpiece in St Nicholas's Church. And he also has exhibitions in Spain and at the Genogli Foundation in Nottingham, which will reopen and run until the end of this year. Finally, uh, Shoa Mavlian is the director of PhotoWorks which is an organisation that puts on exhibitions all over the UK with artists. It also publishes a digital magazine and puts on a biennial exhibition. Um, this year, the title of the PhotoWorks Festival is Propositions for Alternative Narratives. So I think that's something we'll hear about later. Shoa was previously a curator of photography at Tate Modern. So she's been thinking about photography both inside and outside the museum for some time now and about how photography can be integrated into the history of art. Um, a practical note for the next hour, um, each of the speakers is going to show us some images and talk for a little bit about why they've chosen them and perhaps how they relate to this topic. If you have questions that occur to you, either as we're talking or later on, um, you can enter them in the chat box, which, should be, which you should be able to see on your screen. And I'll certainly hope that we get to some of them before the end. Um, to begin, um, perhaps Bill could um, begin by talking about the images that he's chosen and why he's chosen them. Absolutely. Um, Madison, if you can go to the first slide. I'm just going to talk really briefly about two projects that I've been working on at the interface of photography and museums. The first one really has to be A.B. Barbrook himself and his famous project, the Builder Atlas or Image Atlas. Um, the Warburg Institute, which I'm the director of, is not a museum, but its founder, A.B. Warburg, famously used photography to create what might very well be described as a museum of the mind. In doing so, depending on who you ask, he either invented a new kind of art history or he killed the discipline altogether. Now, here are two panels, or in fact, one panel and two photographs from his most famous project, the image atlas or picture atlas that he worked on during the last few years of his life and left unfinished when he died in 1929. As you can see, the title that he gave to the project is Mnemosyne or Mnemosyne, the name of the female figure from ancient Greece, who is not only the goddess of memory, but also the mother of all nine muses. A Warburg's atlas maps our cultural memory through visual constellations tracking themes, gestures, and maybe what we might call memes across time and space. Now this panel, number 77, is not as densely packed as some, but it ranges more widely than most, including the figure of Medea, images of infanticide, champion golfers, postage stamps, and even ads for eating fish. And what you see on the left is a print from the series of black and white negatives taken just before Warburg's death in 1929 within the elliptical reading room of his research library in his native Hamburg. Now, when the Nazis came to power a few years later, those negatives all came with Warburg's working materials to London and can now be found in the Warburg Institute in Woburn Square in Bloomsbury. The original images used by Warburg, and it's nearly a thousand images on more than 60 panels, 
were simply absorbed into the Institute's photo library or photo collection, which has grown since then to 400,000 images sorted in more than 20,000 subject headings. The wood and cloth panels used for the original display have disappeared. And for almost a century, Warburg's Atlas has only been known through those black and white images on the left, endlessly reproduced. But as you can see from the right, all of that is, we hope, about to change. We've been working now for a couple of years with curators Roberto Ort and Axel Heil on a complete reconstruction of the atlas using all of Warburg's original photos. And all 65 panels will be displayed in one room for the first time since Warburg's death at an exhibition in Berlin at the Haus der Kultur in der Welt that opens in early September. We've also produced uh, a fresh facsimile edition published by Hatje Kantz, and you can see uh, what that looks like on the right with much more color. Uh, it's massive. I'll show you later. If we have time, I'll wrestle it up to the screen. It's an enormous volume. So that's the first uh, thing, and I just wanted to put the markers down there. The second project, Madison, if you can give me the next slide, is a project that I've been working on for much longer, more than 10 years. And this is a reconstruction, again, uh, of a historic collection. In this case, uh, the collection of Louise and Walter Ahrensberg, or Ahrensberg, which was built up in their Hollywood house from the 1920s to the 1950s. The results of this project are just about to be published by Getty in a book called Hollywood Ahrensberg that I wrote with Mark Nelson and Ellen Hubler. Now, the Ahrensberg collection first took shape in their Manhattan apartment in the wake of the Arbery Show in 1913 and expanded hugely after their move to LA in 1921, gradually filling every inch of wall and floor in their modest Hollywood house. Uh, until they died in the 1950s, when the art collection was acquired by the Philadelphia Museum of Art, they put an extraordinary mix of European avant-garde, English Renaissance, and Mesoamerican civilization into dialogue through these dense and playful arrays whose visual patterns and hidden meanings inspired a steady stream of visitors. What you see on the left is a photograph of the gallery devoted to the Arnsberg's Brancusis, and they had nearly 20, when it was installed in the Philadelphia Museum of Art in 1954. But on the right, you see one of many pictures, and we have enough pictures of the house to reconstruct a wall-by-wall -wall tour in the book to see how those works were displayed within the couple's domestic museum. And it's uh, pretty clear at a glance that they had a very different approach to display than that which the museum um, would, would choose to display, particularly in isolating the famous artists. There were 40 Duchamps, they got their own room. There were 20 Brancusis, they got their own room. And all of this pre-Columbian material, which is equally important in many ways, went to a different building entirely. The last thing I want to say, and then I'm going to hand over to Matt, is simply to point out that in their own house, they didn't collect photography, oddly, even though they were very close friends with Man Ray, with Edward Weston, uh, with Stieglitz. But they did use photography to contextualize the display. So as you can see, those are the um, archaeological sites from which some of those objects derived. And they would put those in the house alongside, in this quite casual way, uh, the clusters of installed art. So I'm going to leave it there and let Matt take over. OK, thank you. Um, hi. Um, I'm a visual artist and I work with photography because it is the most quick and effective means of getting an image. Um, and there's a couple of works that I've made, installation based works, which directly link to my interest in the history of photography. Um, the first work that we're going to show here is from 2015, it's called In Camera. I was invited by Pete James, who's the chief archivist at the Library of Birmingham collection, a huge collection of photographs right from the very beginning, from the uh, 1930s up until the present day. And he said, come and have a look at the archive and try and make some work with some of the photographs that we've got here. I spent several days looking at this wealth of imagery 
but I couldn't really find anything that I wanted to work with because the, the photographs were all perfect as they were. There was really nothing else I could do. It was like a guy in a top hat with a giraffe at the zoo. There was nothing else to say about that. And then he found this old um, box, which was of uncatalogued images, and we couldn't really work out what they were. They weren't labeled in any way. But looking at them, it seemed that there was something a little strange. And we finally kind of worked out that these were police crime scene photographs from the West Midlands in the 1930s and 40s. And somebody had inherited them and had just come in and dumped the box at the archive and they'd been sitting there for years. So for me, this was like a really um, potent cachet of images to be dealing with because they uh, represented these little scenes where something had happened something illicit had gone on on either the images themselves were very mundane you have like an empty room with a sofa that's knocked to one side and an upturned shoe slightly under the sofa or five sides of beef hanging inside a little trailer or like a dentist a uh, dentist chair inside a dentist room in some, inside somebody's front room. All of them were very, very mundane, but they were, they were charged in some way by this thing, this event that had happened in the room. And because we didn't really have any accompanying notes, it wasn't really, really clear what that was, although some of them had things like indecent exposure or um, stolen property, etc. Uh, so what I did was take uh, 12 of these images and I re-photographed them and then I printed them in a uh, phosphorescent ink onto a clear acrylic sheet. And then I put these large flash lights in front of these acrylic boxes, which I'd mounted the photographs inside. And then they were flashing intermittently. The flashes from the lights charged the image so that they glowed. So you've got this real kind of... Um, uh, charged image which then slowly faded over 30 seconds to a minute so as you walk around they were sporadically flashing and revealing themselves but there was always like a, an eroticism in there because as soon as you arrived in that box to have a look at it it was fading before your very eyes the, the, the truth of what was there was slipping away from you um, in camera is a term, it's what happens in a court. If you want to have a little private chat, then you go to a little room and then talk discreetly uh, without the, uh, the rest of the court hearing. So the idea of these things, these little illicit events, polluting the actual pure negative inside the camera, in camera being in the room and then inside the camera, the idea of this light coming in and, and poisoning the, the, the clear film inside. So, so the idea of a photography and, and, and humans kind of polluting the world in a way and leaving our stains, leaving our fingerprints, leaving these uh, little illicit acts behind us. This is what I was trying to get at in this work, that the photograph is this stain that's left behind. And although it's used for creating great icons, it's also um, quite a useful metaphor for those, those muddy little stains that we leave behind us. Um, I should move on to the next work, because I know the time is quite short. And while I was working with Pete James, he started talking about this first exhibition of William Henry Fox Talbot, which happened in 1937. It was an exhibition of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. And it was an exhibition of cutting edge apparatus and equipment made by scientists. Talbot had heard about de Geer's announcement of, of his uh, process, so he rushed to make this exhibition or to put his photographs inside this exhibition of cutting edge science, which was at the King Edwards School in Birmingham. Uh, and Pete was talking about maybe trying to recreate this exhibition. It was very difficult because a lot of the photographs were unfixed in the uh, 1930s, so they're very light sensitive, kind of impossible to get them out really. And I've been looking for a project to make in virtual reality for quite a, a while, but I can really think of a subject matter because I didn't want to make something uh, with a magic forest and unicorns. I didn't want to make something with documentary realism to it. So I thought maybe if I try to restage this first exhibition of photography from 1937, using the latest image-based technology, virtual reality, then I can talk about these threshold moments when everything changed. 
in 30, 37, nobody had really walked into a room and seen photographs before, although they're these tiny little muddy drawings. It was this new technology, this new way of seeing this world, this new window which had been invented. What an incredible moment. And with virtual reality by 2017, when I made this exhibition, the technology was getting a lot better. The price of the equipment was getting a lot cheaper. You could actually kind of make the content yourself. So it was like, now it's a medium that pretty much anyone can, can work with if they have the interest. So I recreated the room of Talbot by talking to a lot of architectural historians. I tried to find out all of Talbot's images from a catalogue we found from the exhibition, helped by Pete James and by Larry Scharf and Hans Kraus, photographic dealer, and Greg Hobson, Brian Lillidy, Brian Lilly from the um, National, from the National Media Museum in Bradford. We pieced together with pictures we learned and got permission from collections all over the globe to get good digital reproductions. And then we put them inside our virtual recreation of Talbot's exhibition in the King Edward's Grammar School. Uh, then I rebuilt that room in the real physical world and so that everything that you see inside this virtual environment you can also touch so you can wander around untethered and when you see a vitrine with the top photographs in front of you you can put your hands on that vitrine and it feels like glass or it feels like wood there's a little fire burning in the corner and in the in the actual real room i had like a little heater there so it gets louder as you get closer to it it starts crack crackling and you can feel the heat of this little heater and then I had some little Chartist demonstrators outside the window, smashing windows and, and throwing rocks and being generally um, quite, um, they, they were agitators, they were distrustful of certain te technological innovations that were happening because being the industrial revolution, they wanted to, uh, they were very suspicious about innovations that were happening in technology because they were potentially taking their jobs away from them. So I wanted to make something about digital technology and the potential malign effects of this wonderful new medium that we're, uh, we're using, but, but the social consequences of that are as yet unknown as they were to the top Chartist demonstrators in, uh, in, 1930, in 1837. Um, and I think that's probably the end of my allotted time, so I should... Um, Pass on. We can't hear you, Fatima. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, Matt, one of the things that's really interesting about both of those projects is that you had to think so hard about the form of display and sort of engaging with previous forms of display. But particularly with thresholds, I hope at some point we will come back to um, the virtual side of it because and I think in the last few months um, many of us who've never sort of um, experimented with virtual reality or done sort of digital tours of museums have been testing them out um, both for pleasure and, and for work so that's something you had to think about in much more detail so I hope that's something we will come to. Um, Shoair, would you like to talk about your images? Yes. Hi, um, I'm Shoa Madley and I'm the director of PhotoWorks um, and I started my career um, at Tate Modern so I worked at, at Tate for 10 years and I was at Tate at a time when photography was really um, a focus for the museum so uh, Tate appointed Simon Baker as the first curator of photography in 2009 um, and I worked alongside him for the first decade of photography at Tate um, and what we tried to do during that time, um, our strategy really was to integrate photography across the whole museum. Um, so the main strategy was to show photography alongside painting and sculpture and to really integrate um, and kind of attempt to level out the hierarchy between the different mediums um, and kind of re rebalance some of those traditional hierarchies that you find um, in museums. Um, and the last exhibition that, one of the last exhibitions that, that Simon and I worked on together at Tate um, was this one, Shape of Light, 100 Years of Photography and Abstract, Abstract Arts. Um, and this show really was kind of the embodiment of that strategy to, um, to show photography and painting and sculpture um, on a level playing field. Um, so this charted 100 years of um, abstraction in photography 
um, and included painting and sculpture throughout the show. Um, and, and from like 1910 right up until 2018, so a huge um, expanse of time. Um, and we can move on to the next slide. Um, so uh, I've done a lot of work uh, throughout my career in traditional museum settings, but more recently I've really stepped outside the museum context, um, working in non-traditional spaces. So this uh, image is an is, uh, in installation shot from a exhibition I curated um, again with Simon Baker, um, a Don McCullen show at the festival, the Rencontre in Arles, so the longest running photography festival in the world. Um, and this was in 2016. And you can see it's a really non-traditional space. It was uh, set in a 14th, 14th century church. Um, but really, we were also thinking kind of um, creatively about the curation of the show. So uh, we were thinking about the medium um, of, of presentation for the photographs. So McCullen, obviously a really well-known uh, war photographer and a conflict photographer. Um, and we decided not to exhibit, not to hang any of those um, really iconic images of conflict on the gallery walls. Um, instead, we displayed all of those images in their original form, so in, in magazine form, primarily magazines from the Sunday Times um, spreads. So that's the vitrine down the middle. Um, and then the work on the, on the walls printed as jealous and silver prints uh, were Don's work made when he wasn't on assignment. So things related to landscape, things related to his documentary practice that he took on the streets of the UK. Um, so really separating out those two different um, types of practice and approach to photography and those two different types of presentation. Um, and then we can move on to the next slide. So my last image um, is related to PhotoWorks. So PhotoWorks is a platform for photography. It's our 25th anniversary this year. So we've been running um, for quite a while now and we have never had a physical space. We've never had a building and it's never been a, a desire to have, a, to have a permanent building actually. We exist um, in multiple places at any one time. Um, and we run a, we curate a biannual festival. So the Brighton Photo Biennial, which has just been uh, rebranded as the PhotoWorks Festival. Um, so here you can see photography outdoors. Um, this is a billboard in central Brighton that, uh, uh, that actually changed over the course of the festival. So um, this idea of photography in transition, being in the public space and changing. Um, and just, I just want to end by kind of uh, telling you a little bit about this year's festival. So uh, the theme for this year's festival is propositions for alternative narratives. So thinking conceptually about new ways to uh, rethink the history of photography. Um, but we're also rethinking the form of the festival. So we won't have any traditional exhibitions this year. We won't have any exhibitions inside. We'll uh, show content in three ways. We'll have outdoor uh, exhibitions using uh, advertising space. We'll produce a festival in a box. So a deconstructed magazine that we send out to people's homes, to classrooms, to community spaces. So you can install your own festival and become your own curator. Um, and then we'll have online content. So a festival hub where we uh, do online events similar to this one. Um, so really rethinking how photography can circulate around the world and how it can circulate particularly uh, during the time of a global pandemic where um, being inside a physical exhibition isn't, isn't the most um, healthy thing to do at the moment. Thanks, Shara. Um, I hope we'll talk a bit about how photographs seen in different mediums and when you put something outside um, at that scale, then you're sort of competing with the language of advertising in a, in a way. Um, it's one of the things you're doing. But I'm also, um, I think all three of you have brought up um, examples of time travel and reconstruction in different ways. Um, and we'll definitely come on to the festival in the box, which I think applies to all, all three of you as well. Bill, I wonder if you could talk a bit about how yeah. Barberg himself used photography at the time using the photo studio and then the yeah. sort of what happened and not only before Fatima before we we jump back to Barbara can I show the image that we skipped yeah. over by accident I should just go back Madison if you can find your way back to the third slide I meant to show this and I'm really sorry oops that one yeah 
just very quickly, just again, to put down a marker maybe for people, uh, it's probably the one I should have started with and maybe the one I should have ended with um, because it's the earliest known photograph of a photographic exhibition that survives. And it's from the year after the museum that is now the VNA, what was then the South Kensington Museum was created. They showed an exhibition of the Photographic Society of London and the French Society. Uh, and you can see it there in its quite extraordinary uh, hang from 1858. And I just wanted to show that because when, first of all, it's such a historic uh, document, but also when we were revisiting the idea of putting expanded photographic galleries that reunited the art and science of photography at the VNA. We were very much inspired by these uh, pioneering images and pioneering projects. So I just wanted to show that. Um, I suppose an another marker, I think it's right to say that this is the first exhibition of photography in any museum. That's the, um, uh, that's the claim, yeah. So, so between that and the Fox Talbot e exhibition in King Edward's School, which I yep. think is the very first exhibition at all. Yeah, Those are two very exactly. early, early firsts. And I think it is worth saying, I mean, that, you know, photography is there in the museum from the start. It's not just selfies now in front of the Mona Lisa. It's actually a crucial part of the museological project. And that's probably the way now, Madison, if you want to just end our, our screen sharing, it's probably the segue back to Warburg because I think this whole idea of how you study the past, how you bring things together to the eye, how you bring things uh, you know, to the, the mental, to the mind's eye. Um, I think photography has been a part of that uh, from the beginning. And for A.B. Warburg, unlike many of his contemporaries, he didn't buy art. He didn't uh, collect art. He didn't create his own museum, all of which he could have done. But instead, he was interested in gathering as many reproductions of the visual world as possible so that he could assemble and reassemble and teach and study. And I think that's the, uh, the goal. And so he did create his own kind of cutting edge photo studio, but he also used all of those really pioneering studios, especially in Italy, like Alinari and many of the other ones who we still have um, uh, in, in business today to buy whatever he needed. He also sent people out into the field uh, to photograph particular artworks or sculptures or buildings that he wanted. And I think it's also, I um, think I'm right in saying that the we took a museological moment at the VNA was also um, Henry Cole was very involved, very keen that the um, permanent collection should be photographed, and yeah. also um, reproductions were shared at, were a tool for artists as well. I think. Yeah, I mean it was really interesting, and and you know Matt and Shore, you guys jump in too because you have you know pl plenty to bring to this discussion. But I think the interesting thing about the VNA is of course the combination of documentation that Henry Cole was, was crucial for. So they have these things called the guard books, which is a photographic record of every object that entered the VNA collection from the beginning. In many cases, you see them displayed in their original context, which is, as we saw with the Arnsbergs, as we saw with Schoer's example, you know, it really can change. And I think it's very interesting to see how these early uh, images uh, show old forms of display. So time travel for the museum itself, but at the same time, they're using it for conservation, for status uh, object records, for condition reports. They're using it for creative work as well. So Julia Margaret Cameron, very closely connected to, uh, to Henry Cole. And in effect, they, they talk about her as the first artist in residence in a museum. I don't know if that's true, but it's, it's a nice claim. Um, she's certainly one of the first photographers to have a studio in a museum and maybe, maybe quite possibly the first. Um, Matt, when you were talking about reconstruction, when when did the virtual reality and Fox Talbot sort of, when did they go together in your mind? Um, it was Pete James just talking about this museum and the fact that it was like this, kind of, this moment when people walked into a room for the first time and saw these. So Daguerre made a few images and uh, immediately 
told us he was panicked and he had a few photographs at the Royal Society at a meeting they had there on a, on a Friday night. And then he started planning putting these 96, 93 images into this exhibition that was going to happen in the summer of 1937. Um, so it was the the idea of trying to relive or re-experience that kind of magical moment where this new medium was revealed. And it's like, well, you can't really do it. The building that the exhibition was held in has now been demolished, so it doesn't exist. So you can't take the exhibition back to that place. And the photographs themselves, a lot of them, have, they've faded or they're in light proof vault, so you can't really have access to them anyway. So it's impossible. But then this new medium, virtual reality, and I've been looking for a project for a while to, to make something in it. So I was like, well, this is kind of like a, a nice little conceit that I can use this new image-based technology to revisit the past and see these photographs. But there was a lot of thought put in, into how it would have looked. And we had the exhibition catalog, which was a series of notes of all the pictures that were in it. And we had a lot of, a lot of letters, a lot from Talbot to John Herschel discussing how the exhibition was all going to come together. And then we had, we had letters of, from Talbot ordering vitrine. So we need a vitrine this size with this kind of glass in it. So we knew that some of the pictures probably were displayed in vitrines. And of course, those early images, he probably didn't really see them as being artworks that he was creating or photographs even. They were like a scientific experiment on his part. He was trying to preserve the world in two dimensions on a piece of paper. And they were displayed as examples of that. The walls inside the, the building that the exhibition happened in couldn't really have had that much hung on them anyway. It would have been quite difficult. These like neo-Gothic stone walls. It's possible that they built some kind of wooden freestanding wall and hung works onto them. But in the end, I had to make some kind of decision of how I was going to recreate it. So as we knew that there were vitrines and these things were probably uh, uh, displayed as documents rather than artworks, we went with the inside the vitrine. It also gave me the advantage of creating this box through which you could then see as soon as you put your headset on. So you've got like a solid box there, the headset goes on, suddenly that aluminium dye bond uh, material, which is the top of my box, becomes transparent and see you through it, and you can see through it. So there's like a magic that happens when you have the VR headset on, and that was something that I tried to encourage. There's also a little, I'll just finish by saying, there's also a window on the side of my room that I built in the real world. And that window in the virtual world was a painting of King Edward, who had established this school hundreds of years ago. So when you had your VR headset on, you were looking back a few hundred years at this oil painting of King Edward. And on the other side, spectators waiting to come into my real room to put the virtual headset on, could see people in this very modish white environment with these kind of high tech headsets on. So one person was looking back a few hundred years, and the person outside, who was like 12, 18 inches away, appeared to be looking to this very futuristic environment. And so there's different levels of reality were all happening in this very small space. And I was trying to encourage that kind of thing in, inside, the, uh, inside the installation. Um, I think that's really interesting what you said about different levels of reality and different relations to time. Shoa, I wonder, particularly um, talking about non-traditional spaces, and perhaps Matt brought up Gothic churches. I don't know. If, I don't know if the church in Arles was Gothic, but um, but also that um, keeping the the Mac Don McCullens. So the images um, of war that most people would have seen in the Sunday Times um, magazine. Can you? talk a bit but we've also I think seen them in other exhibitions because Don McCullen is a he's a master printer he prints everything himself um he has also made them himself into you know fine art prints at a much bigger size um I just wondered if you have thoughts about what the different effects are see, seeing them like that and then looking down um at, in, at photographs at, at magazines that you can't touch and then looking up at sort of on the yeah. wall yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think McCullen is a very specific example. So um, when you look at his, when you look at the work that he made on assignment that was 
printed in the uh, Sunday Times magazines, I mean, we're talking about thousands and thousands of photographs. Um, and then the images that he printed himself in his darkroom, which everything that exists, almost everything that exists of a McCullum print has been printed by him. Um, you know, you're talking in the range of a few hundred. So uh, that in itself was really interesting. The images that he chose to print himself um, and really take that care to transport them from uh, the throwaway medium of a magazine to the much more um, more kind of uh, high level of the gelatin silver print. Um, and I guess for that exhibition, we really wanted to highlight the work um, that perhaps wasn't as well known. So really the images that he made uh, when he was almost like decompressing from being away um, in conflict zones, when he was wandering around the streets of London or Liverpool or Bradford um, and making work that was really just for him um, and to kind of separate those two things out. Um, and for me, uh, you know, I didn't grow up in the UK and I wasn't of the generation that received uh, those images on my breakfast table every morning, um, like, you know, lots of previous generations did. Um, so for me, seeing the magazines with his conflict images in, um, I think it's really important we remember that as well, because that doesn't really happen in the same way anymore, you know? We don't see that type of photographic reportage printed in mainstream um, mainstream magazines. So I think it was really important to remind people that that form was a very important form of communicating um, uh, that type of photography. It might also be worth um, mentioning that sort of advances in photography have always gone with advances in printing as well and, and the way the two that sort of go back and forth. But also thinking about sort of intention, Bill, I wonder the original panels of the Builder Atlas, were they in any way, they, are, they were a sort of impromptu exhibition, were they ever intended for display? Yeah, that's a, it's a super important question. And it's a slightly vexed issue. Um, they are actually ultimately intended for a book. So it's funny that you should say that it goes hand in hand with printing because the Atlas of images is already an existing, it's often seen as this crazy invention of A.B. Warburg, uh, literally crazy, um, but actually it's a pretty common form of publication in late 19th century Germany. These books that are primarily image-based that teach you the history of economy or the history of sport or whatever the topic is through a sequence of images. So there were these very established layouts and very established technologies and even aesthetics around printing images that he was drawing on and which are of course in his library, which is now my library. Um, but it's really interesting to think about, were these ever meant to be, the question, the key million dollar question is, were these ever meant to be finished? Is there a final fixed version that was displayed or are they in effect a workshop? Are they not mood boards, that's a, it's a silly comparison or a trite comparison, but are they a, a, a kind of uh, literally a workshop, a Werkstatt, that was what, what he saw them as, as a way to work out the relationships between things in visual form to be captured in a transient way, sometimes in a permanent way. But yes, eventually he described there being up to 200 different panels and they would eventually supposed to be put into book form. What's really amazing is the person entrusted uh, ultimately for doing this work was none other than Ernst Gombrich uh, or Gombrich. And Gombrich was hired by the Warburg Institute in 1937, four years after it moved to London, uh, to be the research assistant on the creation of uh, an edition of Warburg's unfinished works. And eventually, many, many years later, he wrote a, a, a biography of Warburg to basically explain why he couldn't finish Warburg's work. And the atlas was never printed. So this strange form, now, now it is. Do you want me to, to actually show the book? I have to show you, hold on. Oh, wow. <laughs> so this is the, that's the big book. 
you need an assistant. That's okay. what it looks like in book four. So hang on. Yeah, so now it is a book, <laughs> a big one. Um, I suppose one of the things that, I mean, a museum is obviously a setting that gives certain meanings to folk photographs, but photographs more than other art forms depends so much on the context and can keep changing. And I wonder, so someone like Fox Talbot, as, as Matt, you said, you know, he was, he was a scientist as much as anything um, and experimenting. And although the original, what we have that is original that survived is very delicate, I don't think he would have been at all delicate with it. Um, but I, Matt, I just wonder when you were sort of going through the archives and not everything in in that exhibition that you used um you were also scanning copies i think or um can you just talk about what, what the sort of what it was like sort of encountering those them as objects yeah most of the images that i used were digital copies so we'd find we'd have to track down where an image was we would find out at the chicago museum and we would then sign several forms and get permission to use it and be, then be sent a digital copy. So we didn't really go into the process of getting hold of the originals and scanning them. I went to the, I went to a few places like uh, the uh, National Media Museum in Bradford, so saw some of the originals there, mm -hmm. and the British Library has a few, I saw them. And quite a lot of these images and a lot of the, the proportion of the 93 images that I recreated, they weren't really like, like photographs at all. They were, they were because he was trying to experiment with the medium and find out a means of using it to make money out of it. And they were just like kind of etchings, uh, drawings, pictures that he would lay on the paper, expose them to light and then create like a, a reproduction of a drawing of a cat, for example. Uh, they didn't work quite as well as, those very kind of smoldering, smudgy pictures of Lake or Abbey at dusk when you really have the birth of that new media on the piece of paper there. But it was interesting that he had, and then he also had the kind of solar microscope images, those images taken with multiple lenses so you could actually see things in high detail. And there were these three different parts that was his contribution to this exhibition in 1937, saying, look at this medium. It could be used as a form of documenting the real world. It can be used as a means of reprodu reproducing kind of a flat artworks that already exists, or we can take pictures of things that are invisible to the human eye. So it's interesting that he was still trying to establish some kind of uh, function for this new medium that he was desperately trying to perfect and, that, and at that time still hadn't still hadn't really devised a meaning of fixing those images so that they were light group. Um, Shoa, you mentioned um, part of this year's Photoworks um, Festival will be um, a festival in a box and I must admit, as soon as you said in a box I found it impossible not to think of Duchamp and the Breton Valleys um, which I'm going to steer towards Bill just for a second because the one thing he mentioned that the Arensbergs, this extraordinary couple um, with their extraordinary art collection where they had a lot of Duchamp, they were an important patron, but I think they also, am I right in saying they also helped Duchamp with the early photography for some of that? Uh, Duchamp actually made the photos in their house of his own work on the walls and then used that as the beginning of the project. So they're very much the enablers of uh, that project. But what we want to suggest in the book, and this is the punchline, I'm giving it to you for free right now. What they really did in many ways is in their house provide this reconfigurable uh, space to play with reproductions of, of art that he then does in the box. So everybody sees Duchamp as the originator of everything. Actually, sometimes the collector uh, or owner or curator uh, has those ideas too, and they can inform each other. And it's, so, yeah, in this case, it's really important that the Boiton Valise, I think, grew literally grew out of the Arnsberg's house. Um, and Shoa, that that um, that model of the refigurable 
miniature museum. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about sort of because there are artists now who sort of work with that in very interesting ways and with photography. Yeah, definitely. Um, and our festival in a box was uh, also inspired by Duchamp. Um, so a really good lineage there. Um, but I guess we were thinking about uh, we were thinking about Duchamp, but we were also thinking about uh, contemporary artists like Diane to sing. Um, and thinking about how over the last 150 years, um, we have got into such a structure of how to exhibit photography um, that usually consists of a frame of some sort, something behind glass or something that is uh, indestructible that you can't touch. Um, and once you, once you don't have to, um, once you don't have to conform to a museum environment, um, that's when we began thinking, okay, how can we use this situation to our advantage um, and use the medium of photography that, that uh, you know, it works very well on the printed page, it works very well in a magazine. How can we turn that, how can we take that one step further so that people can play with it uh, in their own home? Um, so that's what we're, we will really aim to do. And, you know, we publish a magazine each year. We publish an annual magazine. So this is really a deconstructed version of that magazine. Um, it's going to be the, more or less the same page count, just in many, many more different pieces. Um, and the other thing that we will try and do when experimenting with that form is really thinking about how, or trying to get the audience to think about how the order in which you display the images changes the way in which they're read. Um, so, you know, we will send with the festival in the box um, a ideal way to curate the festival. But then there'll be multiple other ways that you can hang those images, which will change the meaning. Um, so also thinking about how uh, the curation influences how we read photography um, and how the audience can take control of that in this instance. Um, that's really interesting and I look forward to making my own um version of that. I think at this point in the stage in proceedings I'm just going to, I can see that we've got some questions in, in the chat room so I'm going to put these, let's have a look. Okay this one I think is for Bill but I think the others will have views on it. Um, was from Elizabeth Orcutt, um, was Warburg influenced or vice versa or did he know Walter Benjamin? I'm struck by um, I think this is, I'm struck by the visual taxonomy that's also apparent in, in the archive and the arcades project. So. Uh, again, yeah, the, the influence, um, it's, it's a really important question and there's some really strong writing connecting the two of them because there are really, really clear uh, biographical or historical connections, but there are also, I'd say, theoretical or uh, media historical connections between the two. Um, and so the short answer is yes, but it's largely from Warburg to Benjamin rather than the other way around. Benjamin was um, uh, very aware of Warburg, um, more, much more than vice versa. Mm -hmm. And um, so yes, it's a really, that's a really interesting. And again, I think it's partly why I wanted to pair Warburg and Arensberg is this, I wanted to say something about this in, in looking a little bit at the other contributions too is it's really interesting for us to look back at the density. I think we think of ourselves as now inundated with images from photographs, you know, overwhelmed, it's everywhere. Actually, in many ways, I think we have a much simpler visual field and much simpler relationship with um, the, the photographic image, much more isolated and contained than when you look at these extraordinary collages or montages or these these mixed hybrid highly dense uh, arrays that are presented over and over late 19th century but especially early 20th century there's something about the density and juxtaposition at work that certainly combined Var or joined Warburg and Benjamin but I think also many others in that period um this is a this is my question actually but I think it was to show up I was interested in that first slide, um, the Shape of Light um, exhibition at the Tate. Um, I think I'm writing that was um, Laszlo Maholi um, Noj. And he obviously made, how did he perceive of the different kinds of works and how they would be shown as well as making them? 
Yeah, it was that that room was primarily uh, Laszlo and Holinage, and um, I guess we were more interested in how you know he was working in painting and photography and uh, sculpture and kinetic sculpture, and um, had we had the space, we would have put some kinetic sculpture in there as well. Um, so. I think we were more interested in um, putting those things side by side. I'm not sure actually how he how he displayed them at the time. Um, but it's interesting when when we look at that image, the salon hang of the first photography exhibition um, in a museum, you know, that's not too dissimilar from those shows in the 1920s um, film and photo where a lot of that early abstract work was shown. And then I think of where we are now, and um, there seems to be a huge change actually from that point and that mode of display, um, which was really like a barrage of images, right? Uh, very, uh, very dense hangs. And now we have really pared it back. And I find that very interesting actually, because we do think that we um, consume so much, so much photography now, but actually it's always been the case, it seems. Um Another example of um, a kind of genre or taxonomy that has changed over time. Matt, I think we've, I failed to ask you about the in camera, the forensic photographs, crime scene photographs, which are not unlike sort of historic photographs of museums in a sense, apart from nothing terrible I hope has happened in those. But I wonder, but forensic photographs, so that's an example of something that seemed very flexible. But I wonder, I mean, this, this was to all of you. Um, if there are forms of photo photography now, um, thinking far into the future, long, long after they're out of copyright, I mean, what, what could happen to say the kind of, I don't know, photographs of the Dusseldorf school, or I mean, what, what would be the new museum objects that we could make out of photography that's happening now? Wild speculation is encouraged. You mean in what form would they exist? Yeah. We, okay. I mean, digital technology is like a, a supreme medium for storing information, photographs being no exception to it. And I have hundreds of thousands of them on my hard drives here in a unit this big. If I want to print them, I can make a choice. And it's kind of interesting looking at the, the Don McCullen show, which I thought was great the way you presented it, because it's, it's always kind of questionable. You have these war photographs, you print them up beautifully, black and white, large frames. But should should we be aestheticizing those kind of pictures or is the correct domain for them in the magazines in the format that they're, they're originally intended for? Uh, and I have this kind of problem all the time is that the, the image on a negative or it's an additional hard drive and then you have the problem of how do I print it how big does it go what's the frame going to be like all of those different decisions which affect the way that you're going to read that image but for me this new virtual world that we have this digital world this way of accessing imagery online etc I perversely I always kind of try and interrupt it a little bit so Virtual reality is a, is a great way of being able to approach an image and have and, and have like kind of an, an almost physical experience with it. I mean, now you can create actual if you have like a Van Gogh painting, for example, you can create that texture, so you can actually see the the physicality of the paint or even the paper in like a Talbot print if you get so close to it. Um, but but for me virtually is never quite enough and I like things to be tangible I guess it's because I'm an artist who normally working in the real world so with like a threshold and another VR XR project that I'm doing at the moment I try to put it back into the real world so you don't really have access to it at home on your headset but you have to go to a room and then you physically touch things and when you have that combination of touching things and then accessing things remotely through this digital device it's really quite uncanny because your brain is telling you that really you really are there when you touch them so for me you know the digital realm is an incredible way of storing and accessing images and will be in the future but, but for me i like it to, to combine it with with other mediums and make something out of it that's not just virtual um 
Phil, I think I've got a question that's, that's for you um, from James Leventhal. Um, when you began, you referred to the Warburg project as both a beginning of art historical research and maybe a kind of end. Mm -hmm. um, can, you exp can you say a bit more about the end aspect of that? Yeah, I mean, the thing that uh, really struck me going to the Warburg Institute is that even though it is the home or the generator of, I don't know, four or five of the most famous art historians in history, none of them ever refer to themselves as art historians. And I think there's always this question of what, just I suppose as with photography, what, what art is it or what discipline is it part of? It's the same with the Warburgian art history is it's really something else. They're always trying to define the term they used and it was literally written on the outer wall of the building in Hamburg is Kulturwissenschaft, so cultural science. And that's what Warburg uh, people are. They're cultural scientists. And it's a really interesting idea because really art history in Warburg's moment was so dominated by a sequence of famous people, famous names and styles, successive schools or successive styles. Warburg's breaking up of that or stepping outside of that and really, again, photography is, was already good at time travel, even in the past. It broke up that linear flow that was uh, lending itself to a, a kind of mm, triumphalist linear narrative within art history. And so that's uh, very much the idea that people uh, credit Warburg with now. Um, whether that's killing art history, maybe that's just a rhetorical uh, overstatement, but in, in a certain sense, as I said, um, not, none of them really talk about Baxendall, Gombrich, none of these people talk about themselves as art historians. So maybe, maybe they did kill something. Um, I think art history has, has not yet been killed. Um, <laughs> it's alive and well. Um, here's, here's a question. Um, how far, how far does the photograph as, muse as a museum object rely on how it's catalogued? So by how it's defined, how it's been filed away. And does that mean that there are still collections that have not been identified yet as collections that could tell different stories about the places where they have been filed away? I'm sure Shore has, has yeah. examples. I have one too. Because yeah. it's, it's sure. Yes, it's a really good question. And um, I think there are numerous examples of where photographs that are found in the archive section of museums actually are beginning to be reclassified, researched and reclassified into the main collection as, um, as artworks. Um, and that means that actually there are, I'm sure, vast amounts of photographs um, that need to be researched and reclassified. I think my one of my favourite examples of that is um, Colin Ford, who was the first curator of phot photography in this country at the National Portrait Gallery. Um, when he got there, he says there were no photographs in the collection, but of course they were. They just weren't classified as the collection. But Bill, to go to your example. Yeah, no, I was just going to say similarly at the V&A, which again, from, the eight, from 1858 onward, was very aware of its own uh, making and keeping of photographs, didn't have a department of photography until I think it was the 1970s. And it was then the art of photography was specifically the name of the department. And what's interesting is that I have to pay tribute to Ella Revilius, one of the great people who works on photography at the v &A, very much behind the scenes. And in some way uh, for me, an unsung hero there is that she has been going around departmental file cabinets and de departmental archives. So the sculpture department has a huge amount of photography. Uh, and she's been gathering that together as a kind of hidden photo library or photo take or photo archive that all museums in some way have or have had. And I think that's the interesting thing is, is what's the difference between the stuff collected as photography to be put on the wall as art and the stuff that has been gathered. Now, in some cases, she's found things that are priceless and probably more interesting aesthetically and financially than any of the things collected since but they're just part of this archive. So yeah, similar example. I think this is a great example of how difficult photography is to pin down and why it's interesting and, um, and what makes it so interesting. Um, I can see that the questions are actually now flooding in, but we um, are out of time. So 
I'm going to stop by saying th thank you to everyone for com coming to this first Museums of the Mind event.